Good morning folks, welcome back from a cracking weekend, it is super hot in the pub, so this morning's uh, tasks include cleaning out the vents on the fridge and the undercounter chillers because yesterday Gemma said that the fridge cut out, the thermal cut out tripped. And I'm not surprised, frankly, because being stood in here is like being in a sauna. So Stuart's had to bring in the big brewing fan that we've been using down at the bottom for brew days. And I really don't know how we're going to chill this room without buying an AC unit. It's difficult to figure out what we, what, uh, what kind of... Uh, try and come up with a remedy to make the pub a little bit cooler through the day because when there are people in here it is becking hot becking which isn't good so we're behind the bar and you can see that we've got a vent on this under counter chiller and also over there on one and these seem to be working nicely they get the ice bath up to temp and they're great but we also have this bad boy so this is the double fridge that we have at the back and at the minute Gemma said she vacked this out last night but it would appear that it's been struggling it has been struggling to uh, maintain temperature and it says of course over here do not obstruct the airflow to the grill this causes serious damage to the unit so compressor blow the compressor in there and then vac up any dust that comes out hopefully that will solve our problems today it's a real bugger so we are literally attacking the heat this morning we've got the big fan on I've brought the vac up I've got the compressor up here and we've been around the back I pulled the bottom off the fridge. We've got in there, we've hoovered and vacked everything out, which was absolutely essential. You can see how dusty it looks, and that's been cleaned. And then these vents were pretty good on the remote chillers, they're fine. So, looking from behind the bar, we've got this junk in the, uh, in the pub at the minute, so we're gonna have to get a, take them back down to the bottom. And me and Stu are really considering getting an AC unit for in here because it is boiling. I'm sure you can hear in the background the chiller. Yes, the chiller is working hard and grafting away. <laughs> uh, which, at least it's doing its job. Uh, we've got the tanks both set to below 10 degrees at the minute and they are there. Uh, hoping to get some Isinglass glass sometime today, hoping to borrow some casks sometime today just so we can get beer on the bar for this weekend when all the brew tubers come across and descend upon Retford to obviously try our wonderful beers. So in the meantime uh, I'm just going to add some auxiliary findings to both tanks to allow the haze and ting to be dropping out of the solution and then hopefully that will have settled over the next couple of days before we decide to block it into cask. I wasn't going to isinglass fine it but if I want to serve it this weekend I'm going to need to so on this batch I'm going to make an exception and I don't have pump clips ready either so I'm going to just mock something up and we'll just have a pre-launch tasting week. Yeah that sounds pretty good. The pre Harrison's Brewery pre-launch tasting week is happening on Saturday or Friday or weekend. Yeah, it's not it, all weekend. So the dose rate of the auxiliary findings is about 200 mil per hectolitre and pour it straight into the beer like so and the cooling and convection currents should be sufficient to mix that ice uh, not ice and glass auxiliary 
findings in. Alright, so make sure we've got that lid centered. That's one complete. And if we spin a full 180 degrees, you will see that we're going to do the same thing to the bitter. This is going to be almost ready to uh, go into cask. So somebody was asking me the other day what actually is the auxiliary findings and why are they suitable for vegan beers. And that's basically because it's a silica based polymer. I thought it was uh, plastic based at first with the word polymer being used. But upon closer investigation, it turns out it's silica based, so it's an inorganic soluble or an inorganic insoluble, well, one of the two. Oh, that looks good. That looks like a really nice bitter. And you know what? It smells really good too. So let's just get this clarifying agent in there. I just saw a, a hair try and make its way in. Now, whilst this would be risky uh, pre-fermentation, it's a well-known fact in the industry that beer post-fermentation is a relatively safe product. So if by mistake you go ahead and you see something land in your beer, well it's a hostile environment now, something like what Theresa May tries to create for uh, any non-Brits in the UK. And uh, basically any nasties that get in there have to contend with an alcohol content and an extremely low pH value, both of which, uh, if you brewed the beer correctly, should be enough to prevent any bacteria replication in there. Which is why, after fermentation, while hygiene is extremely important, I'm not downplaying it, uh, you don't have to worry so much about getting your beer infected. That's all just before the fermentation kicks off the first 36 hours. Danger, danger. High voltage. But from then on, Particularly when the pH has dropped to around 4 or below, which is where you should really be, then you're pretty much in the safe zone. There's your fun fact for the day. And last week, Stu also picked up a couple of essentials for me. Some gloves, because I did actually start to have some skin peeling off my hands through using it in the acid so it's nice to have some clamps as well so all you do is you just pop your gloves on your workspace and clamp them on the shoulder and uh, then when you dip your hands into any of these tanks on the cask washer you know you ain't gonna be Melting! Well, you might be able to hear some strange music in the background, but we do have crackheads living in the flat adjacent. Got some crazy jungle music on or something. Uh, anyway, we've just come out of uh, the brewery. I'm just heading up to Milestone now to pick up some caramalts and some isinglass. Like I said, I wasn't going to find the uh, first few well I wasn't going to find any beer at all but uh, I think the first few batches will just do it to make sure the polish for the weekend when the boys come and uh, they should be able to drink some of this then otherwise it's a bit of a waste of time them coming over so Stu's here we're just going to shoot via my house to drop chance off he's in the back and then we're off I've never been Milestone Brewery before neither have I and we'll go and get some isinglass and some caramels. 
I showed you. It's better than that shit that they're playing up there in Crack Alley. <laughs> up there. Shooting star. Let's go. timing weren't it? Where you been? Just been to pick some Isinglass up and some uh, caramel from Milestone. So we're back. We didn't pick too much up. So we've got some Crystal 110 uh, which the Americans would know as Crystal 60. Oh we would know as Crystal 60 but it's 110. It's the average of the Lover Bond or EBC value. I can't remember which. This is uh, Cara 30, also known as Cara Malt, and Cara 10, which is like Cara Pills, which is like light Cara. So that's light Cara, that's dark Cara, and that's light crystal, essentially. So that's pretty much everything that we use in the blonde, everything that we use in the uh, pale and IPA. And coming around here, I've got no light here yet. We also picked up some Alclear C. So this is the Isinglass. Like I said, I wasn't going to use it, but I've got it now. Uh, this is the concentrate, so one pint of this will make three pints of finings. So that's small enough as well, you see, that I'll be able to fit it into my hot fridge. Just jiggle things around a little bit. I'll get it in there. Oh, what's this? Well, I weren't going to be drinking. Wow, you know they say time flies when you're having fun. I can't guarantee I've been having fun. No, I can't. But what I, but what I have been doing is calculations. Working out what we're gonna sell the beers for, what duty we've got to pay on them. I've ordered the BMS system, so I've been in Comunicaciado with Matt and we're hoping to get that set up sometime this week. Um, but I've decided what I'm going to do on all my invoices is try to display the actual duty costs for the beer. Now I know we get small brewers relief but where the market's falling down is that brewers are passing that saving on to pubs. It's not pub relief, it's brewers relief. That relief is to help you as a small brewer compete with the bigger boys who have economy of scale and this is why there's so much shit beer on the market because we know we have to pay a finite price for a cask of beer in terms of beer duty we know what we've got to pay so the only wiggle room you've got left because minimum wage electricity rent are all pretty much fixed steady costs the only wiggle room you have is ingredients so what do you do if you want to make a cheaper beer or we want to make more money on a beer without changing the price point you cut the ingredients it's a race to the bottom folks and it's not a race I intend to get involved in so I'm gonna declare on all my invoices just exactly what HMRC is charging in terms of beer duty have a look at this so I've made a little beer duty table just here and if we just zoom you in a little bit and refocus you in the top corner there you'll be able to see some of the prices that we have to pay or we're expected to pay so beer duty starts at uh, £8.42 per hectolitre percent at 1.2% 
ABV. That's where we start paying duty. Then we run all the way from 1.2 right up to 2.8 and then after the 2.8 price point it changes to £19. Can you just see that on the edge of your screens? It changes to £19.08 per hectolitre percent. What's a hectolitre percent you ask? So you take that 19.8% and you multiply it by the ABV for every 100 litres of beer you produce. So for instance, if you have a 3% beer, that's £19.08 times 3 for every 100 litres. We're not dishing out 100 litres, we're dishing out casks and in a cask you get 0 0.4 hectolitres which then gives us the calculation of £22.90 for a 3% beer. £22.90 for a 3% cask. That's what we have to pay. If it's a 30 litre keg at 3% it's £17.17 .17. and if it's a 50 litre keg it's £28.62. Yeah. So, for a 4 percenter, let's say you pay £64 for a cask of beer at 4%, £30 of that is, the, is duty. £30 duty. It's ridiculous. It is a lot of money. And then let's come down, so from 2.9% uh, all the way down again, right up to 7.5% is our 19 pounds and 8 pence bracket. From there, it jumps up again. So for any beer which is high strength, you have to add on top of that 19 pounds and 8 pence an extra 5 pounds 69p. So that takes the whole cost and you have to calculate this across the board. It takes you up to £24.77 per hectolitre percent. It's a lot of money. So if you want to make a 8% beer, now a cask of that, £79.26p is duty. Just let that sink in. For an 8% beer, £79. It's almost, it's almost £2 a litre in duty. A pound a pint. Almost a pound a pint in beer duty for an 8% beer. And we come down again. Let's go to the highest beer that I think I'm ever going to make in the brewery. Probably won't. But we've gone up to 13%. So a cask, 40 litres, yeah, two batches on your corny keg, two corny kegs. £128.80 for 13%. Can you believe it? Can you believe that? £128.80 duty. So that, folks, is why I think it's important to let the publican know just exactly what HMRC expects you to pay in terms of beer duty, exercise, exercise, exercise? In terms of excise duty on your product. Now, I know we get small brewers relief, but that's what it is small brewers relief it's not supermarket buyers relief or stupid brewers relief so if you pass on that saving to your customers then you fit into the category of stupid brewers relief that's right it's there to help you compete with bigger established breweries who have already uh, got the economies of scale on their side 7.35, God, I wonder what I've got done today, good question. So, the lease has arrived, but that's for tomorrow's episode. Yes, we'll see you then.